This is a reading of uh, the final story in my collection of erotic fiction, To the Dark Gods. It's called Yes, But Can Tuesday Weld? And um, hopefully what I was saying with this story is that, um, you know, sex is great, but ultimately what matters in our lives is making that connection, finding love with someone. Yes, But Can Tuesday Weld? Once again, I'm pulling this stupid gig at the club. Every fucking Tuesday, I have to sit in the storefront window next to the club's entrance in my skimpiest costume. I don't even have to dance, although some of the girls do try when they pull this shift. Just sit in a metal folding chair from 2 p.m. to 6, like some human hors d'oeuvre. Bob, the club owner, started making all the girls do this at least one day a week. Because he's convinced it will pull more people into the round heels, the club I dance for. So far, it hasn't been a rousing success. And mostly, I just feel shitty when I have to sit here. Like I'm the whore of Babylon or something. I know that kind of sounds ridiculous. Coming from a girl who takes her clothes off for people five, sometimes six days a week. And mostly has no problems with it. But in the club... Up on stage, I really feel in control of the situation. My music, my moves. The men and women are looking only at me, only me. Anticipating that with my next shimmy or twirl around the pole, I'll make all their secret dirty dreams come true. But here in this grimy window facing High Street, I, I just feel like I'm some alien creature who's fallen to earth. No one is really looking for me or expecting me as they go about their mundane Tuesday business, leaving their office, mailing a letter, looking for a good restaurant to eat in. And there are people out there with their families, for Christ's sakes. This isn't some restricted red light district. The worst is when I have to see some little kid staring at me in curiosity, and he or she is pointing and asking questions. And the parents are pulling them along like they are trying to shield them from seeing a bad automobile accident or something. It just makes me want to crawl back into the darkness of the club every time it happens. And it happens a lot. But there's no way out of this Tuesday shift. If I don't do it, I don't get to dance my regular shifts in the club. And if I don't dance, I don't make rent, etc. So I guess it's worth the fucking hassle. Really... On good nights at Round Heels, I can leave with close to $300 in my purse. And I've never, ever made that kind of money working as a cashier at Lowe's or Tempe. So, I endure being the stripper of the day, stripper on display. I try not to think about those families walking past me out in the blazing sun. I usually bring along a book to read, try to concentrate on that while I sit in this torturous chair. I have a BA in English from the Ohio State University, and I probably go through about two or three books a week. Yes, it's true. Right now I'm rereading Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. That's a good book. I've probably read it five or six times. It just struck me this time around. In my situation now, particularly when I do this Tuesday gig, I feel a lot like Lemuel Gulliver when he was in the Land of the Giants. The Brodenagians are what they are called. So fucking small. And subject to the whims and wherefores of all these giant monsters. He's even at one point used as a sexual plaything by the women at the Brodenagian court, who put hapless Gulliver astride their nipples, etc., etc. Swift certainly didn't pull any punches. Yep, that's what I feel like sometimes, particularly on Tuesday afternoons. So it's Tuesday, about three in the after. I'm up in the storefront window trying not to go crazy, my head buried in my book. I'm wearing this hot pink miniskirt that has these open slashes across my breasts and stomach. Leaves little to the imagination. And a pair of platinum stripper shoes with like six inch heels. Thankfully, there are not too many people walking around on High Street right now. It's summer and OSU, where I went to school, is barely in session. The campus is about two miles north of Round Heels, and most people are still at work. 
I have a bottle of water and my cell phone next to the chair. Today's copy of the Columbus Dispatch, if I happen to get bored reading Gulliver. And I have my feet propped up on another chair. So I'm tolerable for now. It really begins to suck about five or so when people leave their offices and cubicles. But thankfully, I only have to endure that for an hour or so. What are you doing? It's Bob Gleason, the club owner, checking up on me like he does every hour or so. Every Tuesday, we have pretty much the same exchange. It's like being in the movie Groundhog's Day or something. I shake my head and glance over at him for my dog-eared copy of Gulliver's Travels. Nothing? Working? I say indifferently, reaching down and grabbing my Aquafina and taking a lazy swig. Looks like you're maxing and relaxing to me, Bob says. There is this wooden partition behind me, a partition that he and his girlfriend Barbara have completely covered in mylar. And there's mylar on the stage that juts out from the window, the stage where I'm supposedly maxing and relaxing. It looks like I'm on the set of Barbarella 2 or something, to the left of me, the partition ends, and there's a small set of steps leading from the stage through a set of beaded curtains to the club proper. And that is where Bob is right now, staring at me through the emerald strands of that curtain. Sure, if that's what you want to call it, I say, taking another small pull at my water. That's what I call it, he says gruffly. Why don't you get up every once in a while and dance or something? I look over at him, and then out towards empty high street. For whom, Bob, I say patiently. There's nobody out there right now. I put my water down and pick up my paperback book, try to read about Gulliver and the Brodenagians, but Bob isn't going away. Not until we've pretty much exhausted our usual Tuesday afternoon exchange. Oh, if you shake it a bit, maybe they come round, he says. If you build it, it will come, I reply automatically. I've said the same line to him like six or seven times in the past, and he never gets the reference. Huh, he says. Never mind, I glance over at him. He truly is one of the ugliest and most loathsome people I've ever met. And he signs my minuscule paychecks, of course. He's about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, or so. He has a broad, Saturnine face, very heavy, very cruel, and a thick black unibrow. He's usually wearing these loud plaid shirts, open almost to the navel. I guess he needs to show off his werewolf chest as much as possible. And tight black pants that accentuate his junk. He has hair growing in his earlobes. You know, I can always get another dancer in here, he says. He threatens me with termination about every week. I become almost inured to it. Okay, then, I say, returning to my book, but not really following it. I know he's still on the stairs glaring at me, and will be for a few minutes. You seen, you seen Barbara anywhere, he finally asks. Barbara is his ersat girlfriend, this thin dyke with short black hair who only goes with him because he owns the club and has money. Really. She's hit on every single dancer in round heels, I think, myself included. No luck there. I love, love being with women. But Barbara's about as attractive as an iguana, about as smart as one, too. I look at him quizzically. Why would I have seen Barbara, I say. I've been in this damn window for over an hour. Well, if you see her, tell her I'm looking for her, he says. And without waiting for any further sarcasm for yours truly, he goes back down to the club. Yeah, will do. I'll put that at the motherfucking top of my list, I mutter, trying to return to my book. Out on High Street, a young couple, probably students at OSU, walk past the window. They are both wearing identical twisted concert t-shirts, jeans. The guy gives me the once over and the girl notices it, grabs him by the arm and just hurries him along. Yeah, salut. My cell rings. The opening bars to the song Take Care by Drake echo through the tiny hot storefront. I smile. That would be Andrea calling me. She always does right after her Tuesday class. Hi, honey, I say answering the phone. I met Andrea at the club. She's a dancer, too, and has been working at Round Hills for close to six months now. She's a tall redhead with the sweetest, greenest eyes I've ever seen, a smattering of orange freckles across her plump cheeks. 
Probably would be on her arms, too, if it weren't for all the tattoos. She's been an ink junkie ever since she was 16, and she's 22 now. How's it going, she asks. Better now than I'm talking to you, I say. We've been living together now for about two months or so, and so far everything has been really beautiful. It might really be love this time. Bob been fucking with you, she asks. Through the phone receiver, I can hear what sounds like a police car or an ambulance pass close. It's klaxon rising to a crescendo and then just as quickly fading. Jesus, things jumping on campus, I ask. What, she says. I said, are things jumping on campus? Every Tuesday, Andrea takes a class on the history of paganism. She's really not working on any degree. She just signs up sporadically for classes that interest her. Well, you wouldn't believe the cops crawling out of this place, she replies. Pretty sure it has something to do with that girl. I'm about to ask what girl, and then I remember. Some maniac has been grabbing girls in the campus area, raping and then killing them with a knife. The first one was about six months ago or so. Last night, some 20-year-old girl's body was found in a dumpster behind the Newport, the small theater where there's rock groups. This is like victim five or something. I read all about it in my dispatch. Yeah, I read about that, I say. This girl was found just like all those others, with about 30 or so stab wounds in her chest and stomach. Jesus. Now, I hope the cops are able to find this asshole and soon. I hate leaving the club alone on Tuesday nights. Tuesday nights, since I pulled this lucrative window gig, are now one of my few nights off. That's okay, really, because Tuesdays are slow. But Andrea has to work until three in the morning, and I'm with her. I hate, hate, hate that she has to sometimes walk to her car in the dark alone, even if it's just parked across the street in the White Castle parking lot. I love you, I say abruptly. I realize that I've never said this before. And what a time to come out with it. While she's walking across the busy college campus intent on getting to her car and getting home. And I'm up here, feeling it being a human hors d'oeuvre. There's silence on the other end of the phone. Hey, Andrea, I say. For some reason, my heart is beating crazily in my chest. I, I love you too, she says. It sounds as if she's crying. Are you okay, I ask. I catch a glimpse of my reflection in the plate glass of the window. I look so outlandish, really, in this miniskirt, and the vents in it, like some werewolf came howling around and tried to get at my boobs, and then gave up because the sun came up and turned him back to normal. I am now, she says, sniffing. What do you, what do you want tonight for dinner, she adds. Whatever you feel like making, sweetheart, I say, looking down at my cartoon shoes. I thought, I thought, maybe the island shish kebab with the garlic brown rice? We are both vegans. I have been pretty much my whole life. I just can't bear the idea of someone on this planet hurting, killing a living creature. Can't bear it. Sure, I say. A warm feeling rushes through my body and my thighs. I feel better than I have all day. A kid slowly passes by the window, a graffiti splattered skateboard tucked under one thin arm. He leers at me and with his free hand flips me off. I ignore him. And after... After Andrew says, maybe we can snuggle on the couch and watch Treme or anything until it's time to go to work. Sounds like heaven, I say. In the club, the song Running with the Devil kicks in on the PA system. It's the first set of the night. Miss Absinthe is on stage right now, shaking it for two people, probably. Sad. Yes, Andrew says. Well, I'm at my car. I'll see you when I get home. I love you, I say. It really feels good to say it. I love you as well, she says, almost reverently. I place my cell phone carefully on the stage next to my water. I try to go back to my book, but the words keep coalescing, morphing to Andrea's freckled, smiling face. I can't wait to clock out and get home to her arms. In the club, Van Halen grinds on. The woofers on the PA are turned up so fucking high that the platform I'm on rattles like I'm in a small shithole apartment under an elevated train track or something. The beaded curtain to the left of me parts and a pale, thin face pokes through. 
It's Bob's dyke girlfriend, Barbara. Her blue eyes glinting like two small cold, cold stones behind the filthiest wire rim glasses I've ever seen. Really. And they are always like that. Couldn't she stop for like two seconds in the morning and clean those fuckers? You seen Bob? She asks anxiously. No, I say. And I go back to my book. <laughs>